Entrepreneurs can get stuck in their head. If you dream of changing the world, but you're not sure where to start, the Add Valued Entrepreneurs podcast will help you transform your life and business. This podcast is for entrepreneurs who want more freedom and fulfillment from their work so they can live the life that they desire. You deserve it, and it is possible. It's time for you to add value. This episode is brought to you by Perfect Publishing. Perfect Publishing is a different approach to publishing a book. Perfect Publishing is sharing a project of hope. We carefully chose heroes of hope who exemplify living a life they created through faith, hope, patience, and persistence. No matter what page you open to in this mini cube of hope, you will find a leader with a big heart. You see you are not alone. The authors may share similar challenges that only hope and action could resolve. Get your free ebook at getadoseofhope.com. Get a dose of hope.com. Just wanted to mention this episode was recorded earlier. And as our audience grows, we just wanted to share some of the value from our earlier episodes. Today's guest, Steve Reeder, is a 23 year internationally syndicated broadcasting professional. He spent 12 plus years working on the internationally syndicated radio show Focus on the Family. Steve was overseeing the production department in 2008 when Focus on the Family was inducted into the National Radio Hall of Fame. He left his award-winning stint in 2010 to help spearhead Dr. James Dobson's family talk. Steve co-founded the Eternal Leadership Podcast, which was named a top 12 podcast to listen to if you want to become a better leader by Inc. Magazine. Armed with those 21 plus years of experience, he brings a unique perspective to the podcasting space. You'll get fresh ideas that work for you and someone to help positively navigate the inevitable curveballs that come your way in the execution of that vision. Most recently, he founded the nonprofit The Never Alone Project, born out of the forced isolation his 40 year old wife had to endure when she was hospitalized in April and May of 2020. And her subsequent death after 21 days, he created the Never Alone Project to address the critical issue of the importance of advocates and loved ones in the lives of anyone facing some kind of medical appointment, procedure, stay, etc. Their goal is to codify into national law the patient's right to at least one screen visitor per day with no time limits. Please join me in this great conversation with Steve. Well, welcome, Steve. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So um, I understand you spent 20 years producing a nationally syndicated radio show and have transitioned to running your own media company, producing podcasts, audiobooks. And others. So how did that transition come about? Yeah. So um, in I'm, I'm one of the few that is was really blessed to figure out something that they really enjoyed that, that I really enjoy doing for work. Um, when I when I went off to college, I wanted to be a cop. And the second the first day of classes in the afternoon, the, one of the, the instructors was like, here's all the bad things about being a cop. 80% divorce rate, high alcoholism, stressful on the family. You become really cynical when it comes to dealing with people because you're dealing with, you know, people that have massive problems and they're a massive problem to society often. And so I really came away from that and was like, ah, oh, do I really want to do this as a career? And I spent the rest of that semester really deciding no. <laughs> and so I thought about, okay, I really love sports and I really love medicine. So why not get into sports medicine, athletic training, physical therapy, that kind of stuff. And uh, when I went off to school at University of Wisconsin Lacrosse, I didn't get a dorm room and they said, you got to go find an apartment. And all of a sudden this time that I was going to spend volunteering in the clinic, getting in front of those instructors and going into the program, uh, it wasn't able to happen because I had to put or I, I had to keep a roof over my head. I had to pay rent and I had to pay for food. And so when I washed, when I didn't get accepted, I actually, that semester, I got walking pneumonia during, during finals week, I pushed through, which I probably shouldn't have done, but I pushed through. And at the end I was like, I need some time off. I need to figure out what I really want to do. And it was during that time that I remembered being in fourth grade. My uncle bought me a Fisher price cassette recorder. And my friends and I used to make radio shows. 
And in sixth grade, an opportunity arose to be a correspondent for a kid's news segment. And eventually I took over, shortly I say, I took over as the host of that kid's news segment. And in, when I was a senior in high school, I remembered uh, creating a radio spot for the morning announcements and a classmate who I knew since the first grade looked at me and she said, Steve, I've never seen you smile like this. And I remembered those instances and I was like, radio, audio production. I love, I love the idea of being a studio engineer. And, and so I finished off school with, uh, with a degree in recording technology. And I got an entry level job at Focus on the Family. I was dating a girl. Her parents lived here in Colorado Springs. And while I was out visiting them, uh, they told me Focus on the Family was here. I was like, Focus on the Family, Focus on the Family. Dr. Dobson. I remember Dr. Dobson. My mom was a big Dobson supporter growing up. And so I was like, yeah, internationally syndicated radio broadcast in terms of, you know, getting my foot in the door. It's much better, much bigger than. Uh, local radio, which was really some of the only opportunities that I had back in Wisconsin. And so I came out here and uh, got an entry level job at Focus, worked my way up through the ranks, became the chief audio engineer, managed the audio production team for the daily broadcast, um, won some major broadcasting awards. And uh, during my time as the chief engineer at Focus, we were inducted into the National Radio Hall of Fame in 2008. Uh, we beat out, no, yeah, it's 2008. We beat out Howard Stern and we beat out Dr. Laura and Bob Costas. And it, we were the first quote unquote religious broadcast ever inducted in the National Radio Hall of Fame. And so um, in 2009, at the end of 2009, Focus decided to finish that leadership transition and Doc knew he wasn't done. And so um, he recorded a broadcast kind of announcing the transition was going to have an end date of February, 2010. And um, he said, I'm going to pop up somewhere on radio. I don't know where, I don't know when, so keep your eyes peeled. And um, at the end of that recording, we recorded it on a Sunday, which is something we never did. And we're airing it on Monday. And at the end of the recording, before I headed to my office to go start working on it, um, I shut powering down the studio and getting everything closed out. I turned to my computer and I typed him an email and I said, listen, I've loved working for you the last 12 and a half years. You want to, you want to start something new. I have dreams of doing bigger things than just studio recordings. I want to get out there and I want to tell stories and I want to do some NPR style kind of stuff, which is, I had done a little bit of that at focus, but never for, never for the daily broadcast. We repurposed some of that into the daily broadcast, but never explicitly for the daily broadcast. <clears throat> so two weeks later, he called, offered me a position and I was the second employee he hired after his personal, after his assistant to help, help build family talk. And when we launched, we were, uh, the marketing company that, that helped get us going, uh, get us booked on radio. Um, they, they said we were the largest rollout in radio history. We <laughs> launched on almost 800 stations and, uh, shortly, I mean, within no time we were on 900 plus stations across North America. And, uh, so yeah, but the money never really came in. I was doing two daily radio broadcasts with half the staff. I had a focus to do one <laughs> and I couldn't, I, I couldn't extricate myself from doing things the focus way. <laughs> I, and I, I couldn't step back from the workload. I didn't have the creative capacity to step back from the workload and really figure out, okay, how can I do this with the team that I've been given? It's possible. And I've figured it out since in, in starting Right Turn Media after I left. So in uh, um, March of 2012, after 15, almost 15 years of working for Dr. Dobbs, and I turned in my resignation because my health was really starting to suffer. Um, I, I lost 20 pounds the last two months that I was there. When I left, I weighed less than when I started my senior year of high school. Yikes. When, when I weighed in for football. And so <laughs> it, it was something where my doctor pulled me aside my last day and he was like, you don't get this, but you have to do this. You have to do this for your health because I think I was 37 at the time. And, and my doctor was like, I'm starting to see trends in your, in your, in your health and then, and these numbers, some bad stuff is going to happen if you continue. So, um, stepped out of the boat within a week or two, I created right turn media but because I was so burned out um, and that love for media just wasn't there. And uh, it took a while to really physically recover from that and uh, took a couple detours and uh, got into financial advising. I was killing it that first year. 
and my wife got sick. And uh, so I had to kind of scale back prospecting, took some, the, fortunately the clients I had under management, those assets under management kept a roof over our heads and we just, and, and I did some side jobs uh, to really help kind of pay the bills. I had a friend who did um, uh, paper towel, toilet paper and soap dispensers installation for the soap companies. So when, when, a, when a school district or when a, when a health complex um, a consortium would, would change out and get and sign up with a new soap dispenser, paper towel dispenser company. Um, they would rip out all those old paper towel dispensers and install new ones. And I did that for off and on for, for Vince for a while to help pay the bills. But in 2016, that love for media really started to reawaken. And, um, so after about four years, I, my, I really started to want to get back into it. And that's when I really started to put some effort into growing Right Turn Media. And we uh, do podcast production. We do uh, audiobook production, radio production, do some basic video stuff. So clients will send us their raw video like we're doing here and we'll format it for YouTube. And if they want, we'll go in and we'll excerpt, find some good clips for social media purposes and format it in a nice good way that really kind of captures people's eyes and uh i've got a couple the, the few clients that do it absolutely rave about the engagement that they've seen from from this service and so yeah yeah i'm i'm, I'm doing something i really enjoy nice well, i noticed uh you, we have a mutual friend who's using your services mike kim Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mike, Mike came to us for his audio book. We, we, he, we doesn't use us for his podcast. He has someone that he's been using there in the, in, I believe in the Nashville area for his podcast, but he came to us for the audio book. And, uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Mike. I absolutely love him. He was fun to work with on the audio book. And, uh, yeah, I, I, He's a great dude, and I'm, yeah. I think that I'm 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 in line to join his mastermind at some point in the next year. Once once I'm wrapped up with this current coaching program that I'm in, nice because he's a, <laughs> he's a good dude. Absolutely. So obviously, you learned some lessons about self care, and and what are yeah. you doing now to 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 keep self care a priority as an entrepreneur? Um, yeah. So I, I want to say it was, so when I recovered from that burnout in 2012, I really wanted to prioritize my health because I realized that, you know, as, as my health goes, so goes my energy levels and my, I mean, I've always tried to stay in shape because both my parents are overweight and I just got a 23 and me, uh, test done and they said i'm pre i'm genetically predisposed to being overweight and so i've always tried to watch my weight and always tried to stay somewhat in shape but um i want to say it was 2014 that in my spirit during some quiet time i would occasionally hear the word biohacking hmm. and um i was like huh what is, what is biohacking and so i started slowly kind of researching and finding some podcasts like bulletproof radio which is now he just just renamed it today to <laughs> uh um what is it the human upgrade podcast hmm. i believe it i believe is what he's calling it um the 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 depth for those that don't know what biohacking is the definition that dave asprey this is a kind of a paraphrase of it but the definition that dave asprey came up with is biohacking is the art and science of changing the bio changing the environment around you and inside you to have better control over your biology. Hmm. So it's all about trying to figure out how to maximize brain energy and how to, how to, how to maximize your sleep, because if, if you're getting garbage sleep, it affects you the entire day. And so, um, so I want to say it was back in, um, it was three years ago, probably I got this ring called aura O U R a, and it's a sleep tracker, sleep and activity tracker. And, um, I found it to be very accurate or, or at least have correlations when it comes to deep sleep. Like, like if I get really, if I get really good deep sleep, like if I get two hours of deep sleep, but I only got like five and a half hours of actual sleep, I'm doing really good because deep sleep is that cycle that, uh, of that sleep cycle where you, your brain shuts down. And what happens is your cerebral spinal fluid is washed your spinal column is just basically washing your brain, helping to remove the toxins that have built up over the over the over a day of uh, of doing work and using your brain. 
And so um, the waste products, all of that. And so um, when I got this aura ring, I, I kind of figured out what I was getting for deep sleep on an average basis. And I was getting the deep sleep of an average 70 to 80 year old man. Ouch. <laughs> and, and, and it makes sense because my entire life, I never felt like I slept enough. I never felt like I, I did. I, I got enough sleep or rarely did I ever feel like I got enough sleep. And so it, it, I started this biohacking journey. There's, there's a saying in the biohacking community, if you can't track it, you can't hack it. <laughs> and so I, I started to A-B test various different things. And I found two big breakthroughs when it came to my sleep. One is taping my mouth shut. So breathing through my nose, when you breathe through your mouth, the parasympathetic nerve, your parasympathetic nervous system is elevated a bit. And so you, you're, you're not, it's, you're, you're, you're kind of in a, little, in a slight fight, flight or fight mode. Hmm. And so it doesn't allow you to really get that deep sleep. And so uh, I, 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 and I got in, I found this out because um, Elis, my late wife, Elizabeth, she went to, I flew her out to Idaho to go spend uh, an extended week, almost a week with her sister. And I was used to having her oxygen condenser on. And so I fired it up. I'm like, ah, oh, what the heck? I'll just fire it up. And since she's not using it, I'll throw on the cannula. My deep sleep doubled and tripled those nights mm -hmm. that, that, that she was gone. And I'm like, all right, it's either I, the oxygen is helping or Elizabeth is not allowing me to get the kind of deep sleep, having her in the bed, which I, I did not want that to be the case. And sure enough, she, she came back. I got a portable unit. I stuck it next to me and sure enough, the oxygen helped. And someone, I posted it in a Facebook group and someone said, Hey, read this book, the oxygen advantage by Patrick McEwen. And so sure enough, I tried AB testing the oxygen and then the taping my mouth shut at night. And sure enough, with some micro, so I get some micropore tape off of Amazon, just put a little piece of tape over my mouth and it just forces me to breathe through my nose and uh, it helped to increase my deep sleep. And another thing that helped me to increase it was, uh, was um, I've, I've heard for years having a cool room helps to, helps to get you into, into better deep sleep. And there's a company out there called Chili Pad. And they have a product, they have a chili pad, and then they have another product called the Uller, O-O-L-E-R. And after my wife passed last year, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to invest in trying in this to try it out and see how it works. And sure enough, I saw another big bump in my deep sleep by sleeping on. And basically what, what the chili pad and Uller do is they cycle temperature controlled water in a, in a mattress pad that you lay on. And so you put it under your sheets and you just lay on this and I, I'm, I, I go from probably, I'd say 11 o'clock until about two in the morning at 59 degree water that's cycling underneath me. So it's helping to cool my body down and that helped. So for self-care, um, in the whole biohacking space, um, I, I, I've, I've heard for years, I've loved saunas and I've heard for years in the biohacking space about the importance of heat, heat and cold. So saunas and ice baths, I've heard those are just, they're really good, uh, for, um, for overall health. And in Dr. David Sinclair's book, Lifespan, uh, why we age and why we don't have to, Dr. David Sinclair is a Harvard researcher. He made this as, as an absolute cornerstone in slowing down aging. And so I have an infrared sauna that I purchased probably, I'd say three years ago maybe. And I found it on Craigslist out on the Western slopes of Colorado uh, in Grand Junction. And I just so happened to have a friend that was driving out to Kansas City to go run a, a, a bunk bed that he had built to a client out there in Kansas City. And uh, <coughs> he threw it on his flatbed and brought it out and I installed it and I got it for $600. Whereas brand new, that thing would cost me $2,500 to $3,000. And so I have an infrared sauna that I absolutely love and in fact i forgot to power it up right before this recording so that way it'd be ready for me to jump in right afterwards <laughs> but um that time in there is something that is huge as well as um getting out and hiking enjoying colorado um i love to do 14ers which for those that are outside of the state of colorado those are the mountains that are above fourteen thousand feet that we have here those granite topped mountains um i've done i think 11 or 12 of them so far i usually try and get about four or five done every summer and uh well i just yeah. saw some i just saw some pictures of beer stand and i think your face was frozen <laughs> no it wasn't me that that one was a friend of mine who okay. who has who has seen me 
talk about doing 14ers and he had done his his second that was his second beer stat this last week i think this weekend and he, he was yeah completely frozen and i was like you're hooked you think you're hooked huh huh yeah that's uh the beer stats are the one we always took the scouts on first because it's pretty much a walk from the parking lot to the top. It's just, it's it's just a nice long. Um, it's it's just long. It's not hard. It's just right. long. It's it's yeah. one of the one of the. If I remember, I think it's like eleven or twelve, maybe thirteen mile round trip hike, and you're going up three thousand plus foot elevation gain. I think that one's probably thirty three hundred foot elevation gain, and it's just a nice long hike, kind of like Pikes Peak, which I did this summer again. Nice. which is uh, 13 miles up and about a, I think about an eight, almost an 8,000 foot elevation gain. So it's just a nice long hike. To yeah, get there's there. a few like Albert. I mean, the tallest one here is probably is, is pre pretty much that same, you know, get on the trail at 6 AM and, and you can be back by, you know, two, three, yep. uh, avoid the afternoon storms. And <laughs> yep, you're below tree line. Once those afternoon storms roll in, which is the key for doing these things during the summer, because you, if you do not want to get caught above tree line with thunder coming down, I've had friends that have told, told me that experience, and it's it's scary. I've had I, I've had the hair stand up on my arms and legs, and <laughs> oh geez, oh I, yeah, I, I, you go you go faster. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, nice. So so what, I know you have two boys. Um, obviously, yeah. they're uh, teenagers now, learning to drive and, and those fun things. What uh, yeah. what do you like to do with your boys? So um. Caleb used to love to rock climb. And so um, he's gone through a phase right now where he's like, I don't know, he's you know, 15 year old, whatever. Um, so we, we, we got a, a founder founding membership over at the new rock climbing gym that was built in uh, late 2019 gripstone here in Northern Colorado Springs, Northeast Colorado Springs. It's about 10, 11 minutes from my house. And so nice. um, it's a nice, easy drive. Uh, he, love rock climbing with him um and then matthew enjoys hiking so uh love to take him out on hikes caleb's not that interested although although we did um i bought a jeep last year a jeep cherokee trailhawk and uh um we went off-roading up up to mount baldy which is here in the colorado springs area and used to be able to drive all the way to the top because i remember with my late wife taking her up there and uh, just a few months after we had started dating. And uh, um, yeah, so we went up to the spot at which she had to stop. And then we hiked the rest of the way up Mount Baldy. And Caleb was like, he was really intrigued with seeing these mountains all around Mount Baldy and seeing these trails going up them. And he was like, dad, I'd love to come up here and camp and do some hiking up, up up there so spending time with my boys matthew loved to fish and uh i really haven't been into fishing i, I mean i grew up love i love i love to fish but i haven't i never had once i moved out here i didn't have a fishing pole didn't have any equipment and i've slowly been starting to get stuff and uh, looking to take matthew out next summer take him out fishing um yeah yeah, that's nice. that's that, and and then and then after my wife passed last year, um, I, I really started. I was like, I need to get into what the the boys are into, and so both the boys are into anime. Uh, Caleb, my fifteen year old, is really into it, and so we have some shows that we'll watch, and um, you know, I'll, I'll make fun of the ones that need to make fun of, and we'll <laughs> we'll do our color commentary from the couch. <laughs> making fun of some of the stupid stuff that happens, some of the ridiculous things they'll say and that kind of stuff. But, you know, there's, there's, there have been some really good, a couple really good animes that, that Caleb has introduced me to that I can't wait for the next season. I'm really looking forward <laughs> to Like there's one called Vinland Saga. It's on Amazon and they've only got one season out. They've green lighted uh, season two, but haven't announced when it's coming out. And it's basically about this Viking family in Iceland. And uh, it's, it's, pretty freaking awesome it's, <laughs> it's really good it's i can i am so looking forward to season two nice it was really well done <laughs> that's awesome so when you transition to right turn media what what's worked or what's helped you build your audience create a following um so i really haven't worked on building an audience with right turn media it's it's mainly just uh 
working with clients one-on-one and consulting with them and working with them to help develop their shows, because there are lots of lessons that I've learned over the course of, um, you know, my 15 years that I worked for Dobson and in the time since that I've seen that podcasters aren't doing that they could be doing for additional content besides this just this this staple which is for most podcasters is the interview format and i have i I believe it's over a dozen different ideas that podcasters can sometimes easily repurpose content into the podcast feed that i've seen work that's really effective and so um yeah, I, I've, I, I enjoy working with, with individuals one-on-one and really helping to develop their strategy and really help to develop from a content perspective and, uh, and, and use the things that they're good at, figure out what it is that, that the client is good at and what could be used as a way for, you know, building their coaching practice or building their ministry or building, uh, their marketing company or whatever it is that that the client is uh, is using their podcast for, and uh, so yeah, I've, I've thought about a, a number of people have have told me you know I should start a podcast for podcasters, but there's so many of those out there. There, there are there are a few now. There, there, there are so many out there and, and my sweet spot is working with clients one-on-one and really kind of digging, digging into who they are and building something around them or taking an existing show and refining it and, or, or even pivoting and relaunching something that is really serves their interests and what, what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, I guess using the audience term for a radio guy comes off a little different. For a business person, <laughs> you know, it's building your list, building, you know, your clients. How yeah. how are, how are you building your business? How are you finding new clients? So that is something that I'm starting to pivot and and uh, do. So um, when I started in twenty, when, once I really started to invest full time effort into Right Turn Media in 2016, um, I have a friend, Kevin Knebel who the guy is freaking awesome. He'd be an excellent guest for you. I absolutely love Kevin. Kevin speaks to financial advisors and realtors, but primarily financial advisors about sales. And Kevin has a system called high tech, high touch. And it's basically taking your contacts and dividing them up with no more than 25 in any of these three buckets at any time. So finding the best referral sources, the best clients, the best uh, people who will advocate for you and best potential clients and sticking them in one of three boxes, A's, B's, and C's. And those A's you contact every two to four weeks, you you set and you make it a system. And the B's you contact every four to to eight weeks and the C's you contact every eight to 12 weeks. And you you set it on a schedule. So you decide if you wanna contact them every two weeks, every three weeks or every four weeks, and you just systematize that. Nice. And um, Kevin used to, uh, Uh, promote a service called refer.com. They've since shut it down. I really sad because the system was so good and it made it so easy that I just log into refer and I'd see who I needed to contact and who I needed to drip. And, and, and the key, the key with this is high touch. You're you're not, you're not letting them know, Hey, I'm here for your services, but it's, it's, it's developing a relationship with them. So knowing if someone's, you know, into Tennessee football and, you know, sending them either a text, a postcard, uh, email, uh, voicemail, or, or if, if, if they're around and if you're able to just a drop by and a drop by is just dropping a coffee off at their house. Hey, I, I picked up this extra coffee. You know, if, if you don't want to hand it to someone in your office, I gotta go, I gotta run. <laughs> and, and I, I implemented that system in earnest in 2017. And in 2018, my business quintupled in size. I made my first hire. And uh, shortly after that, really shortly after that made my second hire. Uh, in, in two editors in uh, Caracas, Venezuela, nice. I found them. I found them on Upwork, and uh, <laughs> and both of them are still with me. One of them has used the money that I paid that I paid him to get the heck out of Venezuela and go Good to Spain, <laughs> and uh, the other one is looking to probably move to the U.S. So he's saving up money. As last time I talked to him, he's saving up money because we had a conversation um, 
uh, I think it was late 2019, early 2020, and just checking in. And I was asking how things were on the ground. And he was like, Steve, did you see the Joker movie? And I said, yeah, I, I, I saw Joker. And he was like, we're, we are a real life Joker situation. We're a real life Gotham City. That's how bad it is here. And so, uh, but on, by, by having two editors in the same location in March of 2019, when the entire country power system, power grid went down, I was suddenly having to do all this work on vacation. I realized I need to diversify. I need, I need to get spread where, where my talent is coming from. And so, uh, yeah, so um, I, I, I used that system, the Kevin Knebel's high-tech, high-touch system. And uh, in 2019, I scaled it back because I grew so quickly that I knew I needed to build some systems in place. And in 2020 is when I re-implemented it. And <laughs> when COVID happened, it was amazing for my business because I was having so many phone calls from all these speakers that were like, we need to start a podcast because we can't get on stages. <laughs> and then, and then unfortunately my wife got really sick and ended up passing away in May. And so it really took now was when I'm really starting to re-implement that system. But I've also had two conversations in the last week about internet marketing and starting to um, develop a, a story and using Google ads, Facebook ads, LinkedIn ads to uh, really start to try to um, grow the business outside of that high tech, high touch system. Nice. We will be right back after this short break. This episode is sponsored by the newly released book, Dream Life Planner, Move from Tired and Overwhelmed to Free and Empowered by Noel L. Peterson, available on Amazon, or you can order a personalized signed copy at empower, E-M-P-O-W-E-R to dream.com. That's empower number two, dream.com. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe, leave a review, tell your friends. Welcome back. Let's get back to more greatness. Well, you've obviously, you mentioned your wife a couple of times, and I know that you've just started, um, actually a year ago, started uh, a new nonprofit called Never Alone Project based yeah. on your experience with your wife's situation in the midst of this pandemic. Yeah. And so are you? Are you okay to share that yeah, story? Okay. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am. Yeah, no, it's it's. I'm 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 okay to share this story, even though it's it's still emotionally, it it, it, still, it still knocks me down. I bet. But but in order to uh, um in order to really help spread the word about the problem and really help to raise awareness, I know that I need to. Um. So right at the beginning of COVID, I mean, literally when the state shut down, my wife thought she had it. Um, she had, she had a friend who her husband worked for the DOD and both of them were exhibiting COVID symptoms. And because Elizabeth dealt with lots of health issues, mainly, uh, autoimmune lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, although the RA was in remission. And then, uh, um, in 2014, she was diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension. Um, we knew she was significantly at risk. I mean, she, she was one of those cases where even though she was 40, um, we, we knew that it was, it, it could be something very serious. And so we, uh, got her tested right away. And unfortunately it took the state two weeks to come back with the negative test, which early on, because they were so in, inundated with, with tests, the state was running it. And so, um, so it just took a while for, for us to get the results, but it came back negative. And so, uh, because of the way in which we shut down, her doctor wouldn't see her in person. She would only see her over virtual visits. And, uh, unfortunately, because of that decision of to not see Elizabeth in person, um, some undiagnosed pneumonia just really took over. And, and on April 29th, she, uh, woke up at about three in the morning, throwing up and at she wasn't even because she wasn't even able to keep a sip of Gatorade down about two hours later, we just decided two, two and a half hours later, we decided we need to call the ambulance and, and go to the hospital. And she told me that, um, I, I mean, she knew that she needed to, and she admitted this while she was in the hospital. She was like, I knew I needed to go to the hospital sooner, but because of the way the hospital shut down and weren't allowing visitors, she was just delaying it, delaying it, delaying it. And so it was a combination of factors that ended up hospitalizing my wife. 
And <laughs> you can't diagnose pneumonia or sepsis over a virtual visit. You can't. And so, um, so yeah, April 29th, she was hospitalized and uh, she was up and down. In fact, that first day, the doctors told me it's, this is a very serious case of pneumonia. Um, but she had been in with pneumonia before, not quite this serious. And uh, so, yeah, uh, over the course of 21 days, she started to get better. And then um, uh, two days before Mother's Day, we were going to the airport to go pick up my mom, who was coming out to go help watch the boys because of the way in which they shut down. They weren't allowing any visitors at the University of Colorado Hospital, the Anschutz campus there in Aurora. And so I was starting to get some media about this plight of people being forced into forced isolation. And because loneliness kills, loneliness increases mortality by, depending on the study, anywhere from 26 to 50%. Because the AARP did a study about loneliness and they equated loneliness to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So I, so this, this, I, I could see this was a problem and I was hearing stories of other people who were into forced isolation and just how it was affecting them. And so um, I started to get some media appearances and I had some uh, newspapers that ran some articles and some local TV stations that ran some reports. And so I was really doing this full court press to try and raise the awareness. So we're heading up to Denver to go pick up my mom. And because the Denver Denver International Airport is right on the way past the hospital. I figured, let's just go early. Let's pick up some euros from the Euro place off of 225 and Iliff. And let's go and uh, just sit outside, FaceTime with her, and then wave to her from the car. And then, you know, she'd wave to us from the window. And um, we ate. She waved. We waved. And at the end, she got super, super emotional because we were so close. And yet weren't able to come in. And whenever I, th I thought I did not think that it would affect her like this, but usually when she gets super emotional, her health would decline. And that night I got a call at about two in the morning that uh, your wife is bleeding in one of her lungs. We're moving her into ICU. Don't come up. What do you mean? Don't come up. Um, I got a call again at 5.30 saying that uh, we've stabilized it, we've isolated it, we're cauterizing those two small arteries, don't come up. And uh, so because she had been on blood thinners with the pulmonary hypertension since 2014, um, they had to give her a coagulant in order to stop the bleeding, to get it to stop, which presented a significant blood clot risk. And they were scanning her like crazy over those next days. And she slowly started to get better. And uh, um, she was set to come home. On, uh, on, she called me uh, or texted me, I think, <laughs> on May 18th saying, they're, they're definitely going to be sending me home this week. And on the 19th, we had a conversation, a few conversations actually, over FaceTime, where um, she said, it looks like we're, I'm going to come home on Wednesday the 20th. And, or the 21st at the latest or the 22nd at the absolute latest, but they were, they were aiming for Wednesday, the 19th. And, uh, we had a conversation at about four in the afternoon, about an 11 minute conversation saying, you know, um, who do you want to come over? I'll try and start to schedule your friends out to stagger them out so that we are getting love from all these different friends. I don't want to overwhelm you. Um, what do you want for meals? We'll order out your favorite meal that first night that, that we're, that you're home, your mom's going to come over on this day and rub your lower back because she had been complaining about lower back pain that last week and a half that she was there in the hospital. Um, just kind of getting all of those details started to get the, get, get things in motion to, to get her the kind of attention and love that um, the hospital had stolen from her those three weeks that she was there. Half hour later, I got a call. Your wife's gone into cardiac arrest. You need to get up here now. I jumped in the car. Actually, I jumped up, looked at the boys. I said, start praying. And my mom, and I said, start praying. Your mother's gone into cardiac arrest. Jumped in the Explorer and started driving up to Denver, making phone calls, mobilizing people to pray. 
letting some of her family know that it was really serious and she might not make it. 20 minutes into the drive, I called the hospital and they said they were still doing chest compressions. And I knew at that point I wasn't going to make it because it's an hour and a half drive for me to get up there. Called again once I start, once I hit Ikea, right, right south of the Denver Tech Center yeah, there on I-25 as I was coming into Denver. And uh, her doctor, Dr. Bull, told me she didn't make it. And so in the time since, I have heard of so many people that have been into some kind of forced isolation and the trauma that, that it, it poses on families. Uh, the trauma of a mom giving birth without her husband or partner or mom or support person there, the trauma on the dad of not being able to be there, um, the trauma of not being able to say goodbye to your loved one. In fact, that night when I finally got home and I told the boys, Caleb immediately jumped up and he was like, I got to go ride my bike. And you see, he jumped up and he went off on a bike ride. Matthew just sat and sat and sat and sat and sat on the couch. And after about 15 minutes, I sat next to him. I put my arm around him and I tapped his chest. I said, what's going on there, bud? He said, daddy, I'm equal parts sad, equal parts pissed. Because the last three weeks of my mama's life were stolen from me. It's wrong. It's wrong. We can balance protecting the needs of the, protecting doctors and nurses and the staff but also give the individuals what they need and not let them rot on the vine like what happened. It's clear that there was some, pardon my friends, there was some shitty planning that went into this because we didn't see this coming with SARS. We didn't see this coming with bird flu, swine flu, all the other quote unquote expected pandemics that, that you know, we were told could, you know, be that next Spanish flu that wipes out a large chunk of the population? Why didn't we have the protective equipment in place? Why didn't we have stockpiles of personal protective equipment so that way families could still allow, or the hospitals could still allow one, at least one screened visitor per day, no time limits. And that's all we're asking for in legislation. One screened visitor per day, no time limits, at least. Have that right enshrined so that way when someone goes to a chemo treatment, when someone goes to the ER, when someone goes to the hospital, when someone's staying at the hospital, when someone's giving birth, that way they can at least have one person there because I referenced my late wife, Elizabeth, complaining about her lower back hurting that last week and a half. It was kidney stones. It was kidney stones. If we had been in there and we had been rubbing her back and we had been giving her that love and attention, we would have been able to ask the doctors, okay, and the nurses, hey, we're rubbing her lower back. It's still hurting. What could this be? It was unnecessary pain that my late wife went through, that Elizabeth went through, unnecessarily, because of the way in which we shut down. And there needs to be change. There needs to be a, a community that rallies around this idea that we're sharing our stories and we're saying we need change. And fortunately, we have three states that have passed no patient left alone bills, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and now North Carolina. Nice. North Carolina just passed one. But unfortunately, here in Colorado, sadly, I, I'm, I'm, I'm unaffiliated, so I don't have a horse in this race. I look at both sides with a very wary eye. Right. I really do. If you think either one of them are on your side, you're probably fooling yourself. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> For me, I, I just I just know obviously I, I spend time as a pastor and 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 obviously chaplain visits, pastor visits, um, the ability to visit somebody and the power of of that short visitation. Um, but I think the bigger piece you just mentioned with your wife and and having these other symptoms that didn't get talked about, um, every patient needs an advocate. They're on drugs. They're on all this stuff. Their body is fighting to survive, and yes. and they need somebody else in the room that can say, um, "What drug is that? Didn't you just give that a little bit ago?" Or what what are what are we treating now? Or hey, she's got this pain that she hasn't mentioned to anybody else. But and so an advocate, my I know from from personal experience how important an advocate can be for a patient that is unaware of you know of what's going on. And so that alone, whether regardless of the love and family member side of it. Yeah. yeah. 
No. And the other, the other half of that equation is also the love and care and support. Because when my wife went into the hospital in 2014, November of 2014, she went in with some undiagnosed pulmonary hypertension that raged over the course of six months. Mm. So in 2013, she had a big lupus flare up that the doctors were like, even though they, they, because the lupus showed the blood markers showed that the lupus was in remission, they were thought it was hormonal. They thought it was this, they thought it was that they were trying different things and she kept declining. And when she went into Anschutz, in February or March of 2014, she spent two weeks there because she had wasted away to 86 pounds. She wasn't eating. She was, I, I, she was basically bedridden. I had to help get her out of bed. I had to help get her dressed. I had to help get her into the bathroom, had to help get her into the shower, those kinds of things. So when she went in, in that spring, that late winter, early spring, they were like, even though the lupus looks like it's in remission, we're just going to treat it like lupus and see what happens. And within six hours, she was getting up by herself, going to the bathroom by herself. And she had such a dramatic turnaround that the chest pain that she had been complaining about ever since she gave birth to Matthew, it turns out that it wasn't the lupus attacking the pericardial sac, which it may have still been because the pericardial sac had shown some scarifications in the autopsy. But the chest pain really was pulmonary hypertension, which is, for those that don't know, it's the blood pressure between the heart and lungs. So when your heart is pushing blood into the lungs, the lungs aren't accepting enough blood that the heart is trying to push in. So that back pressure causes that right side of the heart to enlarge. Now, the good thing is once you get that under control, the heart can go back. But when she went in in November of 2014, it was significantly enlarged and failing congestively. And the doctors told me, Steve, this is an end of life situation. We were in there 24 seven, praying over her, speaking words of life over her, casting a vision, rubbing her feet, giving her the encouragement, the moral support that she needed there in the hospital to be able to pull out of that. Now, unfortunately, when she was diagnosed, the head of pulmonary came to me and he told me, Steve, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but there's a very real possibility your wife won't be around to see your youngest graduate high school. Hmm. It's a terminal disease and it's going to get you un unless there's a major medical breakthrough, which, which we're we're on the verge of some really cool stuff happening to really give these young women who develop pulmonary hypertension in their 20s and 30s and 40s a real hope of having a full life. And that was my hope with Elizabeth was to just keep keep her around long enough. And he he, he said the reason that 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 she couldn't might not be around was because one the Hickman line that's going into her chest that was pumping in meds 24/7 um, pre presents a, an infection risk. And he said, usually patients have one infection a year. Well, I, I took that very seriously. And when I would change her bandage, I would pray over her. I would speak life over her. And I would make sure that I was very sterile and really took a, it really did a good job of trying to make sure everything was clean and I was not presenting any kind of infection risk. And I cut her infection risk by more than two thirds. This was only when she was hospitalized, that was only her second infection. And since she was diagnosed second, nice. when most, when most patients would, would deal with at one. And so that, that other aspect of having people in the hospital, not only advocating, but also supporting, holding their hand, speaking life over them, praying over them, casting a vision. I got a call. I got it. Actually, it was a Facebook message from a friend of mine who, who moved into nursing and she was a relatively new nurse and she worked at a hospital, works still at a hospital here in town. And she told me the story. She said, Steve, I've seen the power of having someone there because before they were letting patients, let, letting visitors in at this hospital, she said, we had a patient who didn't look like she was going to make it through the night. And we called the doctor, we called the daughter and we snuck her in and mom rebounded that morning. She got so much better that within days she was sent home. So here you go, a woman who's on her deathbed that they're bringing the daughter in to be able to be with her to likely say goodbye. And all of a sudden she rebounds and turns around and has, has, you know, the, the will to live because her daughter is there isolation kills and we need to have that legislation in place to be able to protect that patient's right to at least one screen visitor per day no time limits well and and the challenge is that obviously the state advocated in the beginning these different rules and 
and shut down rules. But then each hospital system at, at a certain point has the freedom to determine their own interpretation of, of that. Um, and each hospital system was either in freak out panic mode or, or recognizing. Um, and so if we can't get legislation, we could at least try to get the hospital systems to say, Ooh, we need this. And that's it's, the crazy part, isn't it? And it's not going to happen without legislation. The hospital association is fighting this hard, so right. here in Col so here in Colorado, we tried running a bit. My 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 state rep who lives just a couple miles away from me, he and I become really good friends. Tim Geithner, uh, representative, Colorado state representative. He's the freaking man. I absolutely love him. He reached out to me. So the Colorado Sun, which is an independent paper, independent news publication here in Colorado, ran a story. Um, we were talking about the visitation thing over the course of the weeks that Elizabeth was um, in the hospital. And um, uh, I called them back after she had passed or I shot an email. I said, my wife passed. And they ran an article. They, they called me the next day and interviewed me about it and ran an article. And um, so my state rep found out about that and uh, reached out to me because he had a friend that was there at Anschutz who had, if I remember right, some kind of brain surgery some kind of um surgery where he had to be hospitalized and he was he was begging them to let him go home begging them to let him go home so that way he could be he missed his family he missed his wife he wanted that companionship he wanted that touch he was begging them and they refused to let him go until until they signed off and he was like fine i'm just gonna leave and they said well if you leave without the doctor sign off you're on the hook for all these medical bills so he was a hostage there at the hospital, a hostage. It's morally wrong. It's absolutely morally wrong. And so we ran a bill in 20, the, right at the end of the session in 2020. And uh, <coughs> we had um, Democrat co-sponsors in both the House and the Senate. And uh, the hospital association came in and gutted the bill from a requirement to a suggestion right before it went to committee. It passed, and even still, there were Democrats that voted no in the House. The Senate uh, voted it unanimously. And uh, so we tried to run it again in 2021 with, with, for, for a bill with some actual teeth. And the Hospital Association and Nurses Association came out hard against the bill, and uh, it never made it through committee because no Democrat went over to our side and uh, sided with us. And so the hospitals will never... We'll, we'll, we'll never, they, they have their, they don't want anyone telling them what they have to do because it's going to cost them money to let visitors in, in the middle of a pandemic. It, and, and, and it also, they, they, there, there's also the added aspect of they're fearful of, of, uh, lawsuits, you know, a visitor comes in with COVID and passes it on to someone else. And all of a sudden the hospital is liable that this patient, who otherwise was doing fine suddenly gets that pandemic disease. And so we, we want, we want to protect hospitals from those lawsuits while also give, giving the individual balance. Like I said, balance that need to protect the doctors and nurses and staff while also giving the individual that, that such important personal touch and care and love and what they need in order to make it up. Because if the, if, if, if the whole pur purpose of a hospital is to heal people, is to heal people, why are they doing something that increases mortality by 26 to 50%? Why are they doing that? It doesn't make any sense. It does not. So, so now um, the never loan project, where, where, where's it stand now? What's, what's, uh, so um, I, I announced it last summer and uh, we submitted the paperwork to the IRS only to have it rejected because they're not taking paperwork. And they didn't say that. And so we had to resubmit it. There was a transmission error in that. And then we resubmitted it one more time. They now have it. We're hopefully we're, we're less than a month away from having our final IRS approval. Um, I can raise funds right now. Um, but frankly, to be honest, I, I haven't had the brain energy or capacity to really put any effort into it. When you go through this, this, this kind of a thing, I'm sure you've seen it as, as a former pastor. When someone goes through losing a spouse or a kid, that cortisol spike, that stress response is so elevated that it actually damages your brain. 
and and it can t- it's it's it, it it produces this pervasive brain fog that's that's referred to often as widow's fog and it's it and it can last 2 plus years to to really fully recover from that in may i was just finally at the 1 year anniversary i was sick of it i was done i was like i need to get back to work i need to get back to growing right turn media i need to start turning my attention to the never alone project i need to be doing this stuff <laughs> and so um, yeah, I saw, I saw a functional medicine doctor. I'm seeing a functional medicine doctor up in Greenwood village, which is South Denver, Denver tech center area for those listeners that aren't familiar with the Denver area. And, uh, he's, he's dealing with some cutting edge stuff like peptides, like some of these biohacker podcasts, they're talking about peptides. Peptides are basically signaling molecules. So they're a, they're a chain of amino acids. That's, that's not a full protein. And what it's doing is it's signaling to the body to produce something or, or signaling to the body or it's, or it's a, um, it's a hormone, uh, trigger hormone replacement, that kind of stuff. And so he gave me $2,000, I bought $2,000 worth of peptides and boom, it felt like I was back and I scaled it back and the brain fog started coming back. And, but I've, I've been on a nice, nice steady pace with, uh, some neural regenerative peptides as well as some uh, um, some things to help lower inflammation, um, those kinds of things. And I've got I just bought from another company a bunch of different other peptides to help with various things. And so I really finally feel like I've got the the brain energy and um, the the desire to start moving forward with this, as well as getting back out there and prospecting and starting to take a look at you know a, a digital marketing strategy for Right Turn Media as well as Never Alone. And start to kind of think about those things. And so that that's really where it stands. I'm starting now to really get out there and try and start to fundraise and bring in some some funds. I'm not planning on taking a salary from this. I want Right Turn Media to pay my bills. I want to be working part-time on Right Turn Media. And so that way I can be working the rest of the time on Never Alone. And so we want to hire a virtual assistant. We want to hire a PR person because either part-time or full-time, because this isn't just about my story. No. There are so many people that have that have dealt with some sort of a loan situation, whether it's chemo, giving birth, hospital stays, being kept away from loved ones, long-term care and nursing homes. My God, how many people have died? Their, their, how many people, their, their death was accelerated because of the loneliness. I mean, I, rem- I remember seeing a video that someone shared of being outside the window of their mom and their mom clearly had dementia and she was just, she was weeping. Why aren't you here? Why can't I touch you? Why can't, why, why I want to, it's inhuman. Dr. Um, I believe his name is Zerbin Demania Z dog MD on, 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 on social media and Instagram and YouTube Z dog MD. He had a guest on and they talked about this issue of people dying alone and they called it a human rights issue from, from a doctor's perspective. They call it this a human rights issue and that's exactly what it is. Oh, absolutely. We are social creatures. We are social creatures and we need that love and we need that attention and we need that care. And so, um, so yeah, so I'm now starting to uh, um, look at look at trying to mobilize a community and fight, figure out who the good storytellers are, who have compelling stories, and get us all booked on podcasts, get us all booked on media outlets and news, and talk about this to help raise the awareness. Then also a social media person, uh, because uh, really, in order to really get this thing going, we're going to need a strong social media presence. And then finally, the last thing that likely will happen if if I get a big donor for this idea or a couple big donors for this idea is to hire a ghost writer and get a book put together for by the never alone project. So that way we can, what went wrong? We can, we can present the story of what went wrong, this, how this impacted people, the various stories, and then a plan moving forward. Cause we, 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 we need to present a comprehensive plan because this was a failure at so many levels. It wasn't just the medical community that failed government failed. They clearly didn't plan this out because we used to have stockpiles of personal protective equipment. Why did that stop? (laughs) Hmm? Why did that stop? The risk has always been there. Why, why, why did that go away? 
because if those stockpiles had been in place, hospitals would have been able to, would, would have had incentive, would, would have had this, okay, we're not worried about personal protective equipment. We just need to make sure that we're, you know, screening people properly and letting, letting some people in. And then also it was, it was a failure on industry, American industry. I mean, you anyone can go back to March, April, May of 2020. And there was a real concern about ventilators and there was a real concern about PPE. And there was a real concern about all of these things that we had offshored vaccinations. So much of that had been offshored to China that we were, that it took a while for us to, <coughs> to really bring a lot of that stuff back and get, get ourselves ramped up to be able to build the ventilators and the hand sanitizer and all of that stuff that we had offshored. And so we really need those three areas to come together and, and develop, and we need to develop a comprehensive plan. And really one, one of the things that I want to challenge the industry, American industry with is we need better masks. So that way we can go about our day. So what about this as an idea? I'm, I'm not a virologist. I'm not an immune immunologist. I'm not medically trained, but is, is there a way to maybe 3d print a mask that way it fits someone's face perfectly? And, and allows them to not, not feel constricted, but allows them to helps to reduce that risk of respiratory viral transmission and reduces that risk of, of being able to get it much like an N95 mask will do. Is there a way to get this done? Is there something else that I'm not thinking of that, you know, so we, we need to step, step this up because, you know, as, as, as long as we're funding this, you know, the, the, these labs in China and around the world that are working on gain of function research, this is going to happen again, right? This is going to happen again, whether it's, you know, 10 years from now, 50 years from now, whatever, it's going to happen again. And so we need to have a serious plan in place. And, uh, I've, I've, I've had some people come back to me and say, um, well, I mean, COVID's going to go away eventually, and so there's really no need for this legislation. Uh, but I talked with a, a pathologist who works in uh, the Tampa St. Pete area. She had heard me on on the Babylon B podcast, and uh, she called me, and and we had a we had a couple of really good conversations. And she said, she said, Steve, there has to be legislation because some administrators and some doctors have fallen in love with these visitor restrictions because at hospitals are saving money on sanitizer, toilet paper, the costs associated with having visitors in. And some doctors are falling in love with this because they're getting their rounds done so much faster because there's no advocate there to ask questions and dig in and, and figure this out. And she said, this is going to pop up, pop back up. They're going to restrict visitors even the next flu season. And so this is the goal. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to raise awareness, mobilize the community, heal together, and get legislation in place. Regis the legislative and regulatory change needed to enshrine a patient's right to at least one screened visitor per day, no time limits. Hmm. Because there are hospitals that are allowing one visitor per day, one hour at a time. That's it. One hour per day. That's all they're allowed in. And it's, it's absolutely, they can change their policies at the drop of a hat. They can do whatever they want. And there needs to be some sort of, if this is indeed, as ZDog MD says, this is a human rights issue. We need to have that human right enshrined in law. I absolutely agree with you. And I hope our listeners, you know, willing to share their stories and experiences. Obviously um, I've had a couple of my own, my, my, uh, my dad had COVID and was hospitalized for eight days and was isolated and, and miserable and had no, they didn't even have contact with nurses because it was far enough along into COVID. They weren't, they're like, we're not going in there. We have to put on all the PPE and all that stuff to go in his room. And so he, he mm -hmm. was I, completely isolated. <laughs> um, and, and until he got grumpy enough, they finally just let him go. <laughs> Because because he wasn't going to get any better in the hospital. Um, thankfully, he never needed a vent or never needed much more than a little bit of oxygen. Um, he needed help controlling his cough. 
Um, but my mother is in a memory care facility and she knew who I was before COVID. And now she doesn't because we spent eight months that I couldn't go see her at all. It's horrible. It's um, horrible. It's inhuman. So, absolutely. It's so now I can still visit and, and, but she doesn't know me. So <laughs> it's, it's almost, it's more heartbreaking. Um, so yes, I, I definitely understand. And I'm sorry for your loss, for your Thank boys' you. loss. I'm Thank glad you. that you're able to step in and and focus on them and be their dad and, and do things with your boys. And I hope that can continue for you. Thank you. And I hope that uh, the Never Alone Project continues to get traction and uh, continues to to make a statement state by state yeah. until until you get you know all 50 states. The, to the, say, the, 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 the idea is national. I mean, you're, you're, you're in Colorado, our only course of option, as long as the Democrats, as long as the Democrats are in the pocket of the hospital association, the only hope we have is a, a ballot initiative. And those cost four to $500,000 just to get on the ballot. We need the pot guys yeah. to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's not including the, the advertising that we would need to do in order to counter the misinformation and the deep pockets that the hospital association and the nurses association have in order to, in, in order to spread misinformation about what we're trying to do. It's crazy so, that the cost savings, the cost savings can't be that great compared to the cost of care for somebody that's, that's dying because they're alone and isolated. I mean, I think the evidence at some point, the science is going to prove that, that it's more cost effective to help people live than it is to <laughs> prolong their, their death and misery by isolation. Yeah. So I'm having some conversations with uh, some lawmakers in DC to kind of start to see what the chances are of getting this done. And uh, um, with, with the current house and Senate and president situation, um, because it's all Democrat right now. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're taking a look at all of our options and just continuing to try and move forward because um, this needs to change. Yeah. Well, if you get enough voices, supporting you then it'll it'll take on a life of its yeah. own and yeah get some more power so steve thank you so much for sharing appreciate your time and uh we'll continue to uh hopefully spread the word thank you. i really really appreciate that thanks for having me on absolutely if you enjoyed the show please like subscribe or leave a review we have a free gift for you at addvaluemindset.com that's addvaluemindset.com. We've collected some of the best mindset secrets shared by successful entrepreneurs on our podcast, and we want to give them to you for free. addvaluemindset.com. In our next episode, Mark Savant and Robert talk about the power of podcasting and creating relationships, growing businesses, and generating additional streams of revenue. Podcasts are a great platform for sharing stories and helping others through the power of story.